Euh, je vais passer maintenant à la présentation de Rose Borel. Uh, so Rose is uh, a former student of the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon. Uh, her master's uh, thesis focused on the quest of alterity in Ernest Hemingway's novels through eroticism, sacrifices and rituals. And to continue working on, on those questions, She has started a PhD at Bordeaux Montaigne uh, in 2021 under the supervision of Professor Pascal Antolin. So thank you very much, Rose. <coughs> Can you hear me well? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this colloque once again. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. So Hemingway's work has often been interpreted as an attempt to return to a lost paradise, an unspoilt land. In his fiction, several landscapes come close to embodying this lost Eden. And even in his non-fiction, the reader sometimes encounters places of prosperity and peace that seem particularly favored by some sort of higher power. And it is the case in his two non-fiction works about Africa. So the first one is uh, entitled Green Hills of Africa. It's an account of a safari he did in 1933. And I'd like to quote a passage in which he recalls a hunting trip. We all had the nervous exhilaration, like a laughing drunk, that a sudden overabundance, idiotic abundance of game makes. It is a feeling that, come, that can come from any sort of game or fish that is ordinarily rare and that suddenly you find in a ridiculously unbelievable abundance. The reversal from scarcity to abundance is described in an emphatic way. The hunters are offered the unexpected gift of a plentiful nature, and the absurd excess of game prompts a feeling of elation close to dizziness. Hemingway's second work about um, Africa was posthumously published in 1999 under the title True at First Light. And this fictional memoir was based on a second safari he did uh, with his last wife, Mary, who's called Miss Mary in the novel, uh, in the, sorry, in the fictional memoir, uh, 20 years after the first safari, so in 1953-54. Um, <clears throat> I would like to study the different forms that abundance takes in True at First Light and what ethical, political and aesthetic values are associated with them. Even if Kenya offers difficult living conditions, including mosquitoes, rain or heat, it also appears as a land of plenty. Wildlife diversity is described at length with an almost scientific precision. Um, in this book, Hemingway is appointed game warden of a game reserve, and his mission is to control animals. So he's in an ideal position to learn that humans and animals uh, complement each other in uh, these very plentiful ecosystems. In the 50s, when Hemingway was working on this memoir, America was experiencing an unprecedented age of affluence. Americans massively invested in items based around home and family, uh, such as televisions, cars, washing machines, etc. So the comfort and abundance of this American way of life stands in sharp contrast with uh, Hemingway's life in Kenya. In the first part, I'd like to study how Hemingway condense rich Americans and Europeans who travel abroad. Um, indeed, he tends to distance him himself sorry, from their consumerist lifestyle and uh, their political domination. Indeed, in this book, the narrator tries to become uh, a local, a Kamba, uh, so an ethnic group uh, who lives in Kenya, in order to get rid of his original identity. He does so notably by having an intimate relationship with a character called Deba, a young African woman. And by the way, this is considered to be um, a fictional addition to the, to the memoir. Thus, Hemingway seems to uh, favor scarcity over Western abundance. He strives to live in an unwasteful manner 
without spoiling natural resources. And this code of conduct even extends to his writing style, as I'll try to show in the second part. And finally, I'll talk about how the author tries to reconcile an enduring appeal for abundance and waste. Um, and w yeah, he tries to reconcile that with his ecological, political and uh, aesthetic concerns. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that Hemingway groups together all white men who live by the consumerist system of, of uh, values, whether they be American or uh, European. So when white men travel abroad, they seem to retain the capitalist logic of accumulation of money, as well as their luxurious habits. At one point, the narrator imagines how an American girl he's intimate with would travel to Africa with her husband. She could go with her husband and they could be nervous together. He would always have the long distance telephone, which was as necessary to him as seeing the sunrise was to me or seeing the stars at night was to Mary. She would be able to spend money and buy things and accumulate possessions and eat in very expensive restaurants. When she worked in the night, she could practice counting her money to put herself to sleep. So instead of looking for natural experiences and confronting, confronting themselves with the environment, tourists remain attached to their comfort. Spending money for them is a way to claim a certain social status as well as a way to gain uh, individual satisfaction. They pay to experience a fake authenticity, a parody of the real uh, encounter with otherness. And the narrator adds, um, they could buy souvenir spears from the anglo Maasai stores LTD. So in this satire of American tourists, he highlights the problem with consumerism, which is that it turns everything into a commodity. This, the same phenomenon is uh, denounced in another passage, um, which describes how Deba uh, keeps pictures of famous celebrities, including uh, pictures of Marlene Dietrich, um, along with advertisements for food and pictures of animals' trophies. So all these pictures are put uh, on the same level because they are all commercial goods and animals and women are both commodified. They have become mere images. And to use uh, Baudrillard's terminology, uh, we can say that they are reduced to simulacra, which threaten to replace uh, the authority of reality. The narrator thus exposes the internal workings of uh, consumerism, but uh, he goes further by harshly criticizing all forms of political domination exerted by white people. And in this passage, he even compares reserves and reservations um, uh, with concentration camps. And he adds, uh, the hunters were not allowed to hunt and the warriors were not allowed to make war. People's identities are uh, completely disturbed by the foreign presence. Uh, they become physically and morally corrupted by Western values. And this is particularly visible with uh, the tribe of the Maasai, who are corrupted by alcohol. And um, the narrator writes, I had sent word to the chief, so Maasai chief, that if his young men were not women who spent all their time in Laitokitok, which is a name of a, a small town, drinking golden jeep sherry, he would have no need to ask for me to kill his lion. So there is a clear reversal here. The narrator and his wife, by killing a lion, have become more local in a way than the Maasai men who uh, don't have the strength to hunt anymore and who spend all their days drinking. And we note here that the, um, the fact that the Maasai have become feminized is, uh, is supposed to be degrading. And I think it's interesting because um, it prefigures a link between anti-consumerism and masculinity. And this link has been uh, explored by uh, Sally Robinson in this work called uh, Authenticity Guaranteed, Masculinity and the Rhetoric of Anti-Consumerism in American Culture. Uh, she explains how the anti-consumerist uh, ideology in the second half of the 20th century rests on assumptions about gender. So authenticity is seen as a masculine value, uh, whereas conception is seen as a passive feminine value. So the narrator fears that uh, local people become too westernized and it was a fear that had been shared by travelers uh, ever since the end of the 19th century. And in order to counter that phenomenon, he wants to return to um, so-called primitive values, uh, which was also a desire shared by many writers who traveled in Africa at that time. Um, we can think of D.H. Lawrence, for instance. 
Because uh, the narrator is highly aware, as I've said, of the, the power dynamics of white people's presence in Africa, he tries to deny his whiteness in order to escape moral and political uh, criticism. We don't have the time here to explore um, Hemingway's problematic appropriation of African values and African identities, uh, but I think that what's interesting here is to uh, see that unlike the Westerners he describes, he does try to inhabit a foreign space um, in a more sustainable manner. Um, indeed, this, this book describes a shift from trophy hunting to animal control. Um, Hemingway admits to having hunted for trophies before, but now he only kills for food or uh, in order to eliminate dangerous animals. So he constantly justifies his presence in Africa and his killing of animals. Consequently, he develops an ethical relationship um, with animals who are seen as um, intelligent individuals and not as prestigious commodities anymore. I think that a more subtle way to reject uh, American capitalism is to go back to a gift-giving economy. There are monetary exchanges in this book, but we also find a constant reminder that social relationships in these Kenyan communities are based on um, the reci reciprocity of gifts and on highly ritualized exchanges. The relationship between Deba and the narrator uh, follows this model. He brings her meat, chocolate, uh, sugar, medicine, and she brings him food as well. And talking about ceremonial beer, um, the narrator adds, you know, everything is based on exchanges of beer. Later in the book, he describes a hunting experience he had back in America, um, after which he traded two eagle feathers with a uh, native Cheyenne. And in both instances, Hemingway almost plays the role of an anthropologist explaining the principle of the potlatch, um, so that it's the, the gift-giving economy which, is practiced, which was practiced uh, notably by native peoples in, in America. So he seeks to describe uh, alternative ways of exchanging goods without spending money, and this kind of trade seems to allow for a deeper human connection. In his quest for um, the so-called primitive values, uh, Hemingway thus tries to live in a more ethical and sustainable way. And I'd like to turn now to the, the multiple implications of this injunction not to waste. So an eco-critical perspective is relevant for the analysis of this book. And critics have paid attention to uh, the compassionate treatment of animals and nature that uh, I mentioned earlier. But I think that what uh, needs to be analyzed more is the omnipresence of uh, this injunction not to waste. So at first, the narrator insists on the responsibility of the hunters not to waste natural resources. For instance, I wish the meat wrapped in cheesecloth so that the flies will not spoil it. We are guests here and I am responsible. We must waste nothing. The responsibility is uh, first and foremost political. Um, they must pay particular attention not to destroy the natural environment because as we've seen, white men have uh, that very long history of spoiling lands. But this command not to waste goes further. It becomes an ethical code of conduct extended beyond the idea of protecting the environment. And both terms uh, to waste and to spoil um, really saturate the text and admit a variety of objects. It becomes almost uh, inherently immoral to waste or spoil anything, whether it applies to a physical thing or to an, a more intangible notion. So here are a few examples of, of the use of these words. So the character of Mary says, isn't it lovely to be here alone with our own mountain and our lovely country and nothing to spoil it? And later on, oh no, earlier on. I don't care what you do as long as you don't hurt other people or spoil their lives. And then the narrator talks about how he has wasted time. Um, so this universal rule could be rephrased as never waste excessive energy. Every movement that is not strictly necessary must not be carried out. And um, this also applies to artistic endeavors. Um, <clears throat> Hemingway repeatedly praises people who behave in a measured way without wasting superfluous energy, and this is visible in this comparison. He spoke in a sort of, so he's talking about um, 
a man. He spoke in a sort of swinging lilting voice that moved with the rhythm that a great boxer had when he's floating in and out with perfect and wasting movements. Hemingway's style is characterized by uh, the same quest for control. Dignity is given to what is sufficient. And right from the very first sentence of the book, we have a, a euphemistic prose which uh, suggests more than explains. So the very first sentence is, things were not too simple in this safari because things had changed very much in East Africa. Um, so the lack of details about uh, what these things are, but also about uh, the time and place, um, really intrigues the reader and, and um, engages their interpretative efforts. This aesthetics of scarcity reads, I think, partly as a reaction against um, American excess, which weakens creative um, abilities. And um, indeed, in Hemingway's work, we often find the idea that money and affluence destroy the ability to write. Um, for instance, in the, the sh famous short story, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. And on the other hand, um, discipline and hunger foster creativity, as we've seen yesterday, um, notably in A Movable Feast. And about... Um, about the, uh, Hemingway's discipline as a short story writer, the critic Carlos Baker wrote uh, these following words. He learned how to get the most from the least, how to prune language and avoid waste motion, how to multiply intensities. Uh, so this is about his formative years in, in Paris. And Hemingway himself ha has called uh, this principle the iceberg principle, as you may know. And this um, stylistic principle is echoed directly in the diegesis. Deba and the narrator don't speak the same language. They sort of sp speak a mix of uh, Spanish and Kamba. Um, and at one point, they both use um, a Spanish phrase, en la puta gloria. And Hemingway adds, it is a strange phrase, um, sorry, it is a strange phrase, and not two people would translate it alike. So faced with obstacles of communication, characters can pick words from different languages, which leaves room for uh, linguistic creativity. And similarly, in Swahili, there are no words to say love and sorry. So once again, the characters must develop strategies in order to express um, these feelings and uh, overcome this initial gap. And one of these strategies is also uh, body language. However, it might be too simplified um, to claim that both as an individual and as a writer, Hemingway remains on the side of scarcity. I think he betrays his fascination for abundance and waste um, throughout this book that he tries to reconcile with his ethical, uh, ecological and aesthetic imperatives. So I'm moving on to my last part. Um, <clears throat> There are some internal contradictions between um, the narrator's professed refusal of excess and his uh, real actions. As a rich white game warden, uh, he remains on the side of economic abundance. He cannot discard his identity uh, as an American in Africa. So he provides medicine in the camp. Uh, he buys excessive amounts of food and drink for his friends. And in the following passage, um, the narrator confesses to buying goods in a store uh, just to impress um, other people, to buy other things, to give us importance in the store. So his strategy here, uh, in order to shut off moral considerations about abundance, is to present himself as a Kamba, as a local, and not as a rich American. The spending here, uh, you know, the, the pronoun uh, we, so the spending here is um, a collective action. It's mainly a demonstration of power in front of the Maasai. Unlike American tourists, his goal is not to accumulate individual possessions, but to spend money for the community. Thus, abundance is um, endowed with a social function. It can bind the members of a community together. The narrator and his uh, local friends share copious meals, and more significantly, they drink alcohol in a very um, ritualized way, which uh, has very uh, obvious religious undertones. Uh, moreover, two large parties called uh, angomas in the text, uh, which is the word dance uh, in, in Swahili, are also organized in the camp uh, in order to celebrate Mary and the lion that she has uh, finally killed. 
Um, we must add that she hunts him um, because she has an almost uh, mystical obsession with this animal. She doesn't kill him for animal control. And the lion, uh, therefore, appears as an almost sacrificial victim for the community. Um, the narrator says, each man individually proud of this, our lion, ours and belonging to all of us and Mary's because she had hunted him. So through the eating of the lion, the lion, um, Yes, sorry. Through the eating of the lion, the community is reinforced. And the eruption of an unbelievable abundance of food, drinks, and uh, festivities remains exhilarating, uh, just as the abundance of game was in uh, Green Hills of Africa. And while Westerners spend money in an individualistic way, Hemingway here uh, seeks to redefine the social functions of abundance, as I said, which is to bring men and women together on a more intimate level. And these moments of waste of resources seem to operate a rupture uh, in a lifestyle of scarcity, which recalls Georges Bataille's uh, theories. According to him, human beings alternate between um, accumulation of capital and waste of energy. So excessive energy, uh, called the accursed share, la part maudite, is consumed in uh, unproductive activities such as rituals, parties, games, uh, or um, non-reproductive sexual relationships. And I'd like to finish with a quote from um, Baudrillard's La, La Société de Consommation, uh, who writes precisely about uh, the distinction between waste as the improductive conception of excess, so waste in the sense of uh, the accursed share, and the waste of resources, which is organized within the consumer, uh, consumer society, which is part of the consumer society. Um, so there are two different types of waste here, the festive conception and the waste of objects that, it co that is caused by consumer society. Il y a dans ce sens une différence absolue entre le gaspillage de nos sociétés d'abondance, gaspillage qui est une nuisance intégrée au système économique, qui est un gaspillage fonctionnel, non producteur de valeurs collectives, et la prodigalité destructive qu'ont pratiqué toutes les sociétés dites de pénurie dans leurs fêtes et leurs sacrifices, gaspillage par excès où la destruction des biens était source de valeurs symboliques collectives. Um, so, just to conclude, Hemingway tries to redefine the waste of resources as a creative and collective experience. He constantly wants to um, reconcile two systems of values, uh, so unwasteful sustainabil sustainability on the one hand and exhilarating abundance on the other. It can be argued that he doesn't fully convince the reader in his attempt to redefine abundance as a social link because the reader uh, never fully forgets that uh, what, what the author's original identity is, and uh, he remains a rich, powerful white man in Africa. Abundance remains his privilege and not that of uh, the local people. Thank you.